Hello, good morning or good afternoon, I should say, and welcome to this month's Facebook Live Practice Clinic. I'm Graham Fitch, and what we do in these clinics, which we hold monthly, is to answer Online Academy subscribers' questions relating to practicing. Um, and what people do is send in specific examples of things they're struggling with or they have questions with. And I attempt in this session here to address, I can't claim to answer the questions, but I can, I will certainly address them and give you uh, as much feedback as I can during the uh, short time I have and also not really being able to see you or hear you play. So, I'm, you know, the exact nature of the problem may be somewhere else, but I, I do my best to, uh, you know, make it relevant to everybody. Um, and what we're doing here, or what I'm doing here today, is looking at questions from um, Annie uh, about Bach. We've got, we've got three questions about Beethoven, we've got something about Debussy, so I'll be covering those as we go along. And uh, in the meantime, do let me know where you are watching from. Uh, it's always good to see, even though I'm using my phone for this and my eyesight's not as good as it used to be, so I can't always claim to see everything that you're writing, um, but I will look later and address uh, anything that comes up later on in the comments. So click the hearts, the buttons and all those things that you do on Facebook and the subscribe button if you happen to be watching this on YouTube. Um, and let me just go straight into the first question from Annie, <coughs> who says, I've been learning Bach Invention number no. 8 for two months now and feel that I'm stuck. I would like guidance with bringing out the quavers, uh, that's the eighth notes for overseas viewers, quaver sounds as it jumps from hand to hand. Also, um, there's a fingering question somewhat later in the piece, which I'll look at in a second. So I'm sure we're all familiar with this invention. Uh, two parts, F major. <laughs> In order to bring out the, the the two ideas, I am just trying to characterize as much as possible the first bar, which is the ascending idea with big jumps, and then the descending idea, which is the, the falling down or the tumbling down, spiraling down um, to earth. So if you think of the first bar as a, a sequence of jumps, uh, a third, a fifth, an octave, and, and just shape that line with a crescendo, and just enjoy the zigzag. And then on the way down, make a diminuendo. It's that sort of idea. And then if you were to do that in the answer, uh, exactly the same, what you'd find is as this hand descends, this hand is on an ascent. So that's now a reign supreme. So Bach is inviting us to change the uh, the touch, I guess you'd call it, to change the touch from the 16th note semiquavers to the 8th notes quavers. So for practice, what I would do would be to practice, I call this zigzag practice, and what I'm going to do is to play the right hand of bar 1 and the left hand of bar 2 right hand of bar three, left hand of bar four, etc. Uh, and then I'm going to reverse that. But let me do, first of all show you how you could practice like that. quite neat and what you can do is you can play the the downbeats together so in other words where the first beat of the bar the first note of each bar if there are hands together which there aren't in the first three bars then then play those two sounds together so bar four would start and then that would be just adding that extra note in there or not as you choose you can do that without adding the extra note there so then then you do that the other way around I think from that. So that would be uh, my suggestion for the shaping of that uh, first 
section and with those various motifs. And so what I do then, having practiced the the listening, the zigzag listening, I can I then find myself able to listen like that when I play. So and I'm listening to the right hand. Now I'm listening to the left hand. Right, left. I think you get the idea there that, that my listening is zigzagging because I've trained my ear to listen in that way. Uh, I think that would do the, the job there for you, Annie. Now the fingering, um, it bars 21 to 23, the fingering is awkward and I'd appreciate some tips. This is where we have the uh, this sequence. Okay, now I think, I think what makes that awkward in the first bar is the, is the pinky finger. Now you see, if I'm playing, um, a B flat in this instance with my pinky finger. I've either got to be on my pinky finger position when I play my three, two, three and risk that feeling tight, um, or I've got to move in later to the B flat, which is what I would choose to do. So the problem with having the pinky finger on the key uh, or in, in the position ready is that my three and the two are right in amongst the black keys and that can cause tension problems because I have to curl my fingers up. So my, my suggestion would be to walk in. Can you see how I'm doing that? As I'm using three, two, three, five. Walk out. Stay out. And what I'm doing here on the second and the third beats of the bar is to use rotary motions. Can you see how that works? What is it? Yes. But the first beat doesn't quite fit that pattern. So you could, if you wanted to be in position, you could be, if your hand is comfortable uh, being in position, this would be a good way to practice it. could play the B flat first and then A, G. That is a possibility for, for practice if that's helpful to you. The other thing I would always say, um, if ever anybody says something, my right hand is difficult or, or I'm struggling with my right hand, I would immediately look at the left hand just to make sure before we do anything with the right hand that the left hand is really stable. going to want to play those detached but it's very useful to practice legato why well two reasons two reasons one i can really hear that as a line when i connect and shape the line really feel the intervals feel the intonation if you will these are thirds a diminished fifth. Uh, I, I'm getting a sense of the, the intervals, how, how it would be pitched uh, vocally. Um, the other reason is pianistic, in that when we play staccato, we can easily lose our position on the keyboard because we might be moving just a bit too much. Now that, I'm, when I play staccato, I'm much more aware of the, the vertical element, but, but actually the music moves horizontally. And I don't really want to play these without um, feeling the connection to my keyboard. So when I play them detached, I, I'm sensing them as a broken legato rather than as a bouncy kind of staccato. Having said that, you probably will want to bounce a little bit. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing there, but I am bouncing very close to my keyboard using my forearm. Think of a trampoline. And if it is your left hand that's giving you problems, just practice bouncing on each note two or three times. And so on, and then the next time just bounce twice. And the time after that, bounce once. So if your left hand's really good, uh, the right hand has a good support underneath it.
let's move to the next question that comes to, to us from Diana, who is playing the Beethoven Bagatelle Opus 119, number one. And Diana is having problems with getting to the chord in the left hand in bar 19 from bar 18. Uh, okay, let's look at that um, first. And then Diana also mentions a, a parallel spot later. Right, so th this, this little bagatelle, I think, is very sweet. It kind of droopy at the beginning. Uh, There, some editions have A flat G, which I don't like. I'm, I'm used to hearing, uh, you hear more? yes, I think that's much more elegant. This gives you parallel octaves, which somehow doesn't quite feel right. Um, whichever notes you choose, though, let's look at the left hand. Now, there's no fingering in this edition, I'm working from the Vienna or text here. Um, but I also got the Henle Urtex, which does have some fingering in it. Now, let me go back to the spot that Diana's talking about. That's a bare fifth there. That's got to be two and a five, hasn't it? Now, the next chord, I would finger it one, three, five, and then two, four, one. So getting back to your question, because your question is very specific. Um, Get, I'm having problems with getting to the chord in the left hand in bar 19 from bar 18. So that means uh, 17, 18, right, it's this position to this chord here. Okay, I, I think the first thing to say about that is you'd want to have two hand positions. One hand position for the bare fifth. And you'll notice that my thumb is, is not on the black keys like the other two fingers thumb is in a nice comfortable position where it feels happy. Now to get to the next position what I've got to do is to simply move to a different angle here in my forearm. Can you see the angle there? So I feel here that my, my angle is, is straight on uh, with, with a hand and here there's just a little bit of, of direction to the left, not enough to cause a twist but enough to um, just feel different. So for practice purposes here, Diana, what you could do is to do what I call selective landing. So what I'm going to do now is to land on my top note and then touch the remaining notes of the chord in afterwards. Let me do that now with the middle note and touch the remaining notes in afterwards. I could do that now with the bass note, five at five, and then add three and one later. Let me pursue this a bit further. Let me play three and one, and then five. Let me play three and five, and then one. Let me play one and five, and then three. So if you've done all of those selective landings, you should find relatively comfortable. I got very comfortable. I'm sensing that I can make a connection from my second finger to my third finger which feels good. Now I have to lift this chord in order to get to the next one. Two, four, one, two, four, I would suggest here, followed by a thumb. You could keep the thumb on the A flat and play one, four, resolving to a two, four. That would be entirely your preference. Um, Diana does say, uh, any tips to practice these bars would be welcome. The problems show up when I try out both hands together. Very important point there that if we work separate, or rather, put, let me put it this way, no amount of separate hand practice is going to enable us to play hands together. And yet, we do need to know what's going on in each hand. So I do recommend separate hand practice in conjunction with hands together practice. So it might be something like this, together, separately, separately, together, separately, separately, together. In other words, we keep coming back to the together, um, but intersperse that hands together with some separate hand practice, um, especially in the left hand, if that's the problem. So then when you put together, I would practice stopping on that chord. Stop. And 
until you're comfortable with the landing and then stop there and work on those little sections so now I've got this part of the chain and I've got this part of the chain now let me join those two small chains together Because I've worked on my left hand uh, consciously in a variety of different ways as you saw um, when I put hands together my left hand is automated I don't really have to think about what it's doing uh, I think that will also apply to your next section Diana that you mentioned okay so then uh, another Beethoven question from Carr who asks uh, I would like to ask how should I practice the legato octaves in Beethoven sonata opus 14 number one bars 65 to 80 um, and then there's another question there from from Carl later yes well, well this section is uh, notoriously problematic for probably many people who, who aim to play it what we've got is a, a legato octave here a line in octaves against a spinning accompaniment a broken chord which has to be very light, of course, uh, in order for that to, to not drown the, the top. Now, of course, the problem comes with legato octaves because no octave uh, passage can be really, truly legato. Uh, so it's legato, um, as in we, make, we create the illusion of a legato by, in this instance, very careful pedaling. Now, you've got to ask yourself this question. Am I OK using a combinations of five and four is my hand all right with that? Or if it isn't, you'd have to use all fifth fingers, which works fine. I'm going to just, I'll show you both ways. The, the, the reason that there's a dilemma there is because, you know, for a small hand, you might not be able to reach the one and four. And even if you, if you can reach it, you want to avoid the, 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 the pinching here of the wrist, the twisting at the wrist, which is really problematic because it causes tension. I mean, you can try this out for yourself. If you just hold your arm in a normal position, you can wiggle your fingers very nicely. But if you put, put it on a twist like that, that slowed it down by about half and it feels very tight. So we do not want that. So if I, I can, my hand is big enough to use the fourth finger on the G sharp without changing my hand position. Therefore, I, I would use that. But if you can't, then just use five, five, The pedal is going to bring that together, but before we get to that, let me just give you a little bit of, uh, well, a few suggestions about practicing octaves since you asked that. Uh, and this is a practice clinic after all. Um, the first thing I would do is to think of, think of the octaves as two voices. So we've got the top voice and, and practice it by itself. And I'm using just discrete pedal to make the connections. And shaping that line beautifully, as beautifully as I can, um, with little hairpins, inflections. We don't want uh, each note to sound identical, we want to phrase it. Make it sound gorgeous. Um, having done that, you'd want to do the same thing for the thumb, but, but much lighter, because the thumb is going to be a shadow for the fifth finger. can't see what I'm doing there but I'm playing on the tip of my thumb um, which is not the uh, not the flat of the thumb we don't want to play with the flat of the thumb because that slows us right down so on the tip of the thumb if you can see it if I do it in the left hand let me just do that uh, let me to play it an octave too low two octaves too low and you see how my thumb is on the on the point there not on the flat so that's one thing um, and the other thing is that the tip of my thumb adapts to the black and white terrain so I'll curve it a bit more for the black key can you see what's going on there there's just a subtle uh, movement going on in the tip of the thumb there uh, that, that helps us to refine the movements there the distances so then having done that there are all sorts of traditional ways to practice octaves which uh, involve um, well let me just go through them First thing I would do would be to double tap my pinky and then 
firmly to neuter. And as I do that, I just rest in the thumb. My thumb is really just, just literally resting on the key. Then I would do that the other way around, but much lighter in the thumb, and maybe even faster. You could even do this. Play sixteenths. See what I'm doing there? I'm measuring out the the underneath thumb in in sixteenth notes, semiquavers. So that, you, that the hand feels the, 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 the firmness in the pinky and the lightness in the thumb. And that's, that's very important that we, we voice that and we have the two sensations uh, in the one hand, the light thumb and the firm pinky or outer side of the hand, five and four. Okay, now uh, hopefully that will help you. No, no, I haven't, haven't discussed the pedaling. That's really important. Um, because we, we will be relying on some pedal for resonance. But I've only got my pedal down a tiny bit. Uh, Sorry for my wrong notes. Um, I want to change my texture when I get to the pianissimo. So I'm playing a little bit more staccato in my left hand. Leggero, really. Get, get a good sound there. And then more pedal when I want my crescendo. And when I've got that sforzando, just more resonance. So what my foot is doing is just adjusting by fluttering. I'm not able to write in the pedaling I use there, but I'm fluttering the pedal uh, to thin the texture out. And to clear. It's just enough to create the illusion of a legato there. So uh, let me show you now with all the fifth fingers. Uh, using all fives instead of the five and the four combination and it works just fine um, right now car also asks I'm also not able to run fast enough for the semiquavers in the left hand bar 91 and 93 that's here where, the, where we come into the recapitulation not forte but the, I think the trick there is to, to notice that the forte um, doesn't necessarily apply to both hands equally I would rather play my scale lighter, and certainly for practice, practice the, the right hand very firmly. A good solid forte. Just work on that right hand so that really that feels so nice and solid in the hand. And then when you add your left hand, first of all, start off pianissimo. Sorry, that's better. Kind of sometimes difficult to talk and play at the same time. So really, leggerissimo, which is of course much less effort uh, to play lightly. And you also want a little pedal. What I'm doing is just giving a little bit of resonance to the scale. Um, just a, another practice. So that's a concept of sound but for practice I would practice chaining in other words just play the first two notes of the scale as fast as you need and as comfortably as you need uh, as you want rather then add another note you might want to work on that snippet for a little more than just one or two repetitions practice until you're happy and then add the next finger and then so when it comes to crossing over the thumb, 
if your elbow is high enough and farther, far enough away from your body, that crossing feels very smooth. But if, I'm, if I've got my arm too close to my body, when I come to that moment, I have to make a kind of jerk, jerky movement, leading to a condition I call KFC elbow, um, which we don't want, because that movement there, do you see, if I start too low in my elbow, I have to adjust there and there, and then I get into all sorts of problems. But if I'm starting a little higher, and uh, with my arm far enough out, I mean, I'm not talking about extremes, but far enough, then when I come to the crossing there, and there, and here, it, it works very well. So hopefully that will help. Um, April. This is a question from the How to Play Fast workshop. Yes, what I, what I did, um, what we do on the Online Academy is every now and again do a series of workshops, um, Zoom workshops, and you'll find links in the description below to how you can access the, the past recordings. But we just did one on how to play fast. Um, and April is asking, how do you ensure musicality along with speed? <clears throat> I often listen to music and hear people playing very fast. Somehow they can sound like they're playing faster than their ability. And it's not musical, even though it's clearly played. On the other hand, some musicians play faster than one would have thought possible. And the sound is fluid, rippling and musical. How do you retain the beauty and thoughtfulness? Thank you. That's a fantastic question, April. I think that's just a, a brilliant question question um, to ask because you know there is so many elements there that, that could contribute to that um, perception you know it comes down to technique in the end that, uh, and and how, how we're practicing is if we're practicing mechanically the the, the mechanical uh, product uh, somehow we can't shake off when we're trying to play musically so you know I'm thinking about metronome use and overuse of the metronome which I hear quite often. And I can always tell when somebody's been doing that because the music goes by in sort of square blocks, like, like watching a movie frame by frame. So you hear this bar and then you hear that bar and you hear this bar. You don't hear how the music ebbs and flows across. So that's where faulty practicing can, can affect the uh, product. If we're playing too much mechanically or if we're practicing too loudly, um, you know, often when we've, we've got forte, uh, passages or fortissimo passages uh, I hear from listening to practice room through practice room doors people practice fortissimo way too much and what that does is it it tends to deaden the the the, the sound uh, or rather deaden our ear to the sound and it's got very few nuance uh, so you know practicing softly practicing pianissim, pianissimo is a very good thing to do on a kind of regular basis not only does it save your ear but it enables you to hear much better um, my, my piano playing improved when I did a few, uh, when I took some harpsichord lessons and we moved on to the clavichord, uh, having to listen to such uh, tiny sounds um, and create real beauty with those tiny sounds was a fantastic ear training exercise for me. Um, so that's one thing. When I talk about technique, um, it, when we've got a really, when we've mastered a piece technically, the movements that we use become really small and efficient. I once had a, a teacher who said, excess motion is inefficient technique. The, the key word there being excess. So perhaps we're moving too much. Um, perhaps we're practicing too mechanically. But what will happen with a master, when a master plays, the movements are really small and the movements are super efficient, enabling the performer to play very fast, uh, fast as they want. Um, yes, and avoiding too much sluggish, slow practice for a fast piece is also very important. To work on a piece fast, um, which could be in micro units, uh, you know, the slow, and I've just got something that's come to mind that's got nothing to do with this clinic, but... Uh, <laughs> if you practice like that, it's unmusical. What I would want to do... I want to feel that these three notes lead to that downbeat. And I'm shaping my phrase so that it's the high point, low point, and 
and then can you feel how the music's climbing here and then highest point midpoint that's the the gravitational pull if you will of the line so if i practice slowly uh, or rather when i practice slowly i can still use that uh, template too much left hand see i'm also practicing the balance between the hands let me get the a flat this time so i'm practicing slowly but i'm adding the shape and the balance in other words, I'm listening to, to the musical product rather than just moving my fingers. Um, Marilyn is learning the Debussy Reverie and she is struggling with the polyrhythm, particularly the one in bar 21 with the octaves. I struggle with getting things up to tempo in general, but this slows down when I get to it. Um, and Marilyn goes on to, to mention other things about octave playing, which I'll get to in a second, but let's just look at the polyrhythm first. So it, it, from this section, which is bar 19, isn't it? Yeah, so from bar 19. So the polyrhythm, if we go straight to bar 21, we've got a three in the right hand against a four in the left hand. Now it's easy enough to do it slowly. Um, if you think of what actually happens in a three against four polyrhythm, cross rhythm, you've got both hands together on the first beat, and then it's left, right, left, right, left, and then together again there. Now that won't, that'll give you a good kind of rough, rough model. Uh, if you want to do it precisely, the rhythm comes out between the hands as this. Yam, pa, 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 pa. Where did you walk today? So if you're imagining that in a 12-8 time signature, you've got a dotted crotchet, that's a dotted quarter, um, quaver crotchet or eighth crotchet, and then crotchet quaver or eighth. Let me just talk in crotchets and quavers. So dotted crotchet, crotchet quaver, quaver crotchet, dotted crotchet. So I can slow that right down. Can you hear that? Where did you work today? That's the way it actually fits together, but it's very difficult to hear that when it's faster. So you can do a little exercise uh, with a, I'll show you now uh, to, to practice for that. And here's where I like a metronome. I'm not going to put my metronome on now because I'm actually, it's on my phone, which is being used to record this thing. So you'll have to imagine a metronome going. So what I'm doing is dividing my left hand into groups of fours. My right hand in threes. And I alternate until such time enough to try it together. So what, what happens then is I'm listening right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand. And when I put it together I'm able to feel evenness and control in both um, hands. So, so that's one thing you can do. Now you can apply that to this piece. Imagine there's a metronome go, going on there. Alternate, and then eventually you will find you will get that. Now it's a little bit like riding a bicycle or learning to ride a bicycle. You'll fall off the first time you do it, you will fall off. But go back to the alternations again, and then the second time you do it, you'll probably fall off. Uh, but if you persist patiently and do that little and often, you will find, just like learning a, 
to ride a bicycle, that you, you will eventually be able to do that without thinking. So that the... Another example of a four against three, where I can actually talk to you and play this because I'm not needing to think, because it's, it's become uh, automated. It's become a habit, a muscular habit, if you will. So just getting back to octaves in general, um, Marilyn is uh, noticing a strain on her right thumb when she plays octaves, uh, not only in this piece, but also in the Mozart uh, K283, which I'll look at. So, okay, uh, I, I, we were talking, I was talking about octaves in relation to the Beethoven example from Opus 14, that the thumb very often, uh, well, I sense when I play octaves that my thumb is steering me across the keyboard and is agile, um, and, and I want the sound from my pinky finger. I want the singing sound from the top finger. So what I'm doing there is focusing my voicing here. So I practice this. Keeping very flexible in my, my wrist. Um, now the same suggestion I had uh, for the Beethoven, for practicing the, the, the pinky voice by itself and then the thumb by itself applies here, as does the, the choice of fingering, you know, whether you're going to use any fours on the black keys or whether you're going to use all fives. Um, I would practice the top voice by itself and then I would include the E flat, the middle voice, and I'm using my pedal. Keeping very supple here. Um, and then I would do the same, I would actually add that with my left hand. I wasn't happy with my sound there. I'd go back again and, and make sure I didn't have that nasty accent. But just to save time, I won't do that now. Now let me, let me play my thumb. pinky and I'm playing my thumb very lightly. You will find that if you practice scales in octaves with a double tap of the thumb, uh, you, you will improve your sense of firmness here and lightness here. I'm thinking of, well, since we're in the key of F. Uh, going there I'm, I'm double tapping my thumb very lightly I could even do if I wanted I could even do a little kind of rhythmical thing or just something to, to keep my interest alive um, very light in the thumb so again the voicing doing the top a little bit there but that's the, the basically the idea and um, Marilyn you also mentioned K283 octaves let me just go there 283 um, Mozart so that's this sonata right so the octaves come in um, where do you say 16 to 21 they create tension in the left forearm and I have to practice short periods of time on them uh, okay, well, you shouldn't ever be getting tight or tired from anything that you do at the piano. Uh, so it, it, let's just look and see. Now, I would, again, for these, recommend a, a, a forearm bounce for the octaves. Which, now the bounce comes from, it's a little bit like being on a trampoline. I, I haven't been on one for years, but uh, it's kind of an exhilarating feeling of letting the, the springs spring you up. So if you let the, the piano keyboard spring you up, I would suggest starting off by just playing each note perhaps two or three times, or maybe even more. Four times. So my, my hand is firm enough to support the, the, the sound that I want, um, to support the rest of my hand. So in other words, it's a firm hand, it's not a stiff hand, it's not a tense hand, but it's a firm hand. So I've got a grip in my hand there. Uh, and then what I'm doing is just sensing that the movement is coming from my forearm. I'll show you in the other hand. And when I get good at bouncing on the spot, what I could do is just to go up a scale and then back down. 
down again with that forearm bounce. Uh, so. You'll probably have heard there that I was shaping my octaves in the sense that they're not all equal. Um, I want to give that direction over the bar line and onto there. You know, I, want, I don't want to hear heavy, 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 but uh, there's my arrival, my next arrival, and now here, can you hear the shape? the high point there at the modulation. So if I would add that to my right hand. Now that's overdone, that shaping is overdone, but you'd want something like that. Oops. You'd want something like that going on, some sort of shaping, contouring going on. But I, I the, the difference there was that I was using my forearm to make the bounces, not my wrist or anything else. Okay, uh, I think we have covered that. And Right, now da Danielle has a question that I'm going to finish with this question. Um, she says, hello, excuse me for my English. I'm French and I hope you will understand my question. Uh, yeah, don't worry, Danielle, I got, I got the, the gist of this very well. She has a problem with the fifth finger of the hand. Very often it remains stuck in extension. It doesn't stay relaxed near the keys when I'm not using it. Are there specific exercises to rehabilitate it? Well, I like that uh, term, rehabilitation. I've had this problem since the beginning, but no teacher has taken an interest in it. I now have the impression that this problem is a break on my progress. Thank you very much for your help. Um, yeah, that's a very common situation. I call it pinkyitis, where the pinky just points upwards or stays out in extension, as, as Danielle describes it. Um, there's no quick and easy fix to this, but I, I've found that uh, over the years when I've, I've had that issue with, with students who come to me with that problem, that they're, they're not aligning behind the fifth finger when they play. So if, if they're playing a five finger position, let me take one. See, my instinct there is, is my natural instinct is to move across somewhat so that when I ra land up on my pinky finger, my arm is behind, behind me. Can you see that? So because I'm using a tiny, tiny, tiny little lateral adjustment in my wrist there, my forearm and the finger that, that is playing form a straight line from here to here. Now you can't, you can't really think about that too much when you're playing, but you can when you practice. Move, move. The increments are so small that gives me a natural alignment. Otherwise, if I were to stick in thumb position, I've got to use this puny little pinky to play the, the top note. Whereas when I come with my wrist, I feel like my pinky is just an extension of my arm. I don't have to operate the pinky finger like this. So that, that could be one thing to try. Now you could make a few little exercises up for yourself, Danielle. I'm, I'm gonna, show you one uh, that's based on, and I'm going to use the, the, the dreaded H word here, the, the Hannon word. Um, I want to at this point distinguish between doing Hannon, as it says in the book, and using the, the, the patterns of notes that travel up and down the keyboard for our own devious ends. So I call this hijacking or, uh, what's the word I use? Jailbreaking, yeah. Uh, Hannon. I'm just using the pattern, so don't think I'm doing Hannon, please. Otherwise I'll get all sorts of letters. He does Hannon! I don't. I sometimes use the patterns of Hannon, uh, and I have to, I feel like I have to stress this because there's such a division in the piano world between the old school and the new school, uh, and Hannon has, has been put on the naughty step, but by a lot of, of, of teachers and a lot of players. Uh, so I don't want to get into that debate now, but if you can see what I'm doing, I'm missing out my pinky, and I've made a kind of my own version of exercise number one where I miss out the note between the thumb and the two on the way up but I just don't play my pinky and yet this is an exercise in control of the fifth finger can you see what's going on there the pinky is just gliding across the keyboard uh, it's I'm not lifting it 
I'm mobile, I'm mobilizing my hand. And my pinky just stays where I want it to stay. Um, you can do that with regular scales. But you have to make sure that you've got a good uh, technical solution to the problem of the thumbs and, you know, however you're playing that particular scale. Uh, put your attention on the on the pinky. Uh, I just want to show you uh, an old school resource, which if you use, again, the first exercise, if you use it wisely, um, this can be very helpful. Now, I had this same situation when I was a first year student, uh, first year piano student. I had the vestiges of that pinky problem. And my piano professor gave me the Dachnani uh, numbers one up till six. Uh, not, repeat, not for strengthening the fingers. So we, di we didn't do anything in terms of strengthening. It's really just, uh, if I show you exercise number two, I, I tend to, if I'm going to use this, which I use actually less and less nowadays, uh, but it, it, sometimes it, it can be helpful. Exercise number two, where I'm resting my, with my thumb in this in the E. I'm, going, I'm changing this to a five finger whole tone position. I'm resting in that thumb and then just very lightly little pinpricks of staccato. Then I rest on my second finger, no pushing. And I'm very mobile on that key. Just playing the surrounding fingers, putting all my focus on the finger that's resting in the key, so that make sure that it's not key bedding, pushing or, or, or lifting up. And my whole arm is completely free and uh, loose. And now my forefinger, just rest on there just to make sure that you're not pushing. And you can see there all my fingers are on their respective keys. I'm still using the, the wrist and my thumb actually is coming away from the bottom note when I come to my pinky. So there's nothing fixed about that hand position. It's very mobile. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm playing as lightly as possible. So th those are some thoughts, but you know, Daniel, I would suggest that um, w if you put your focus on that one situation of every time you practice, let's say for 10 minutes, you just uh, set a timer or something. And for those 10 minutes, you're just going to focus on your pinky. And if you do that little and often, you, you, you hopefully after a while, you'll find that it's the, the pinky will start to obey you. But, but I do think that the source of it, the root of it lies in misalignment. Um, that would be my guess anyway. Well, we, we, I think we've come to the end. Yes, uh, we've come to the end of, of the clinic. And I want to just end by thanking everybody for submitting their questions and for, for watching and listening to this. Um, and do, as I say before, if you haven't subscribed to the Online Academy mailing list, please do. There's information about that in the description uh, where you'll be able to find out all sorts of uh, other things about what we do on the Online Academy. So I will look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you for watching.